Uh, now, I'm extrapolating here motives for the Shinarites. Yep. The one thing I'm clear of in the story is that God does, in fact, end up scattering them, the very thing they're the, the most afraid of, and it's the scattering that brings a blessing to the world. You talk about the splendid chaos of pluralism. That's our world. Yeah. Actually, that's our, that's Toronto. <laughs> that's Toronto, that's, that's Chicago, the sure. city I come from, yeah. And it is, on the one hand, pluralism is a great threat to our cultures. It's a very difficult thing to live with, how to negotiate these different cultures and these different values. And as a Christian enters into those, the Christian brings another set of values that are important as well. So it creates a lot of tension, uh, but I think most people who've had a, an encounter with people from other cultures, their lives are broadened uh, and, and enriched in, uh, in a way that uh, wouldn't have been possible otherwise. And I think God allows for the different cultures in the world, which uh, symbolically begins with this story of, of, the, of Babel spreading them out across the world, to, uh, to help us appreciate various aspects of his creation. I mean, at, at, the, at the day of Pentecost, when God and this supposedly, according to some commentators, reverses the curse of the Tower of Babel, actually what happens is it's not that everybody starts speaking the same language. No. No, they all they end up, they all understand yeah. each other, but they're all, everybody from their own culture is speaking their, their tongue, mm. which to me strikes me as the kind of the biblical healthy balance of the gifts of the variety of cultures now becomes, of, it's still a variety, but it become, it's done in unity. Mm. They all understand the same thing. The first half of the book, you look at biblical examples. It, it is like putting on the chaos glasses and, and looking at those stories and seeing how God worked in, in shaking things up. And then it's the church from the early church to the church today. What, what do you want to do here? What, I mean, I, I just found it very challenging to my theology and my understanding of scripture. I saw new things. Um, you, you're on a mission though. You're on a mission. Yes. Uh, my perception of the contemporary church is that like as in most eras, we're always tempted to take our faith and make it a matter of control and manipulation. And whenever I see that happening, um, I'm interested in helping us rem to remind us that the uh, of the dynamic role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So I see uh, a number of examples. Uh, perhaps the most prominent one is how uh, quickly and easily churches take evangelism and they actually turn it into merely marketing. Now I've got nothing against marketing. In fact, I think the publishers who market my book are doing a good thing. <laughs> but I think when we mistake a marketing for evangelism and evangelism for marketing, we are we are creating huge problems for the church. Marketing is an, is an attempt to get people to do something that will benefit the marketer. So the fact is I want to market my book. I want people to buy my book because I want them to read it. I want them to do something as a result of that. And uh, that's an important, in a sense, that's a transaction we understand. We understand when an adver advertisement comes on, the advertiser is asking something from us. Mm -hmm. um, the gospel is about something that God just gives to us. God is not trying to, in a sense, get us to do something, although we will end up doing something once we get what he's trying to say to us. God is giving us a gift in Jesus Christ that is absolutely and utterly free. There is no quid pro quo that if we do X, God will do X. You know, God will do Y, I guess. But he wants uh, us the to The gospel be... is God does X, even though we haven't done Y, and mm -hmm. even though we're really bad at doing Y, and we will continue to be bad at doing Y, we're sinners. While we were sinners, while we were doing nothing, worth, uh, not worth his, his time. Or, uh, rejecting him. Rejecting him, God came to us. Mm -hmm. So when we do our evangel, when we do evangelism, we, we, have to do, we have to work really hard to make sure it doesn't sound like marketing, mm -hmm. because marketing in our cultural minds means there's a quid pro quo, there's a something for something exchange going on here. Mm -hmm. And when we present the gospel, we have to be really clear that we're talking about the gift of grace, absolute gift. And, and I'd like to add that the takeaway here in, in injecting some holy chaos into the church and into us as followers of Christ isn't just about who we are becoming. It's about reaching our world. Exactly. That's, yeah. that's clearly yeah. part. 
Yeah, your because vision. that's uh, yeah, that's another thing we do to control religion. Religion becomes all about us and our transformation. Mm. That makes it you know becomes manipulating God, using God to make us better people, when really God is in the is is really wanting in a sense manipulating is putting it a little strong, but he wants to use us to go out into the world, share his gospel to, to people out there. And so we've, we've got to figure out different ways to get out of ourselves. You have an online uh, feature called Soul Work. Good word. And I love that you've celebrated John Stott, uh, calling, uh, calling this uh, what the movement looks like at its best. Uh, tremendous loss, but what an impact he had on our evangelical world, mm -hmm. and you quote the New York Times columnist who uh, waxed eloquent about the movement. I'm going to read this. Uh, this. This is just in case you think we're getting a little bit of a spanking here. Uh, <laughs> he says, this is the New York Times columnist, Nicholas Kristof, mm -hmm. evangelicals are disproportionately likely to donate 10% of their incomes to charities, mostly church related. More important, Go to the front lines, at home or abroad, in the battles against hunger, malaria, prison rape, obstetric fistula, human trafficking or genocide, and some of the bravest people you meet are evangelical Christians or conservative Catholics, similar in many ways, who truly live their faith. I'm assuming this is an unbeliever who has observed he is an unbeliever. Yes. Uh -huh. that um, people who are serious about living for the Lord are really making a difference in our world. These must be the liberated yeah, ones. Yeah. yeah, in fact, I, I, I work at Christianity Today. It's, a, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's called the flagship magazine of evangelicalism. I don't know how true that is, but certainly representative of American evangelicalism to a large extent. And we have a lot of people either that either come on staff or think about evangelicalism and say, uh, you know, those evangelicals, they're hypocrites, they're, they're pious, they're not really out there. But I keep on reminding people that if you go to a garbage dump in Cairo, <laughs> and you see a Christian ministry there, or in mm. Manila, or some of the worst places in the world, and you find a Christian ministry there, it's either going to be Catholic nuns or a group of evangelicals or Pentecostals. I mean, it is a movement that is able to mobilize people to do the most sacrificial and heroic things for Christ. So I'm fundamentally uh, a cheerleader for evangelicalism and Pentecostalism because of the way it can prompt people to do the most extraordinary things. But of course, like, as in any movement, that doesn't mean that there aren't places with, that need reform. Where we could grow. Where we can grow. Yes. And I know as managing editor, senior managing editor of Christianity Today, you, you, you've got a really great perspective on the contemporary church. Well, one of the things we try to do is report on what the church is doing worldwide. And then uh, also, in, so there's some news, but there's also some commentary. There's some uh, biblical articles. There are some devotional articles. There, are, there are reviews, movie reviews, book reviews to help people think Christianly about the world they live in, mm -hmm. more Christianly. And then, of course, we try to challenge them. Always trying to push people, push ourselves, really, to the next level of discipleship, whatever that might be. And of course, we assume it's not us pushing; it's the Holy Spirit prodding that we're just trying to respond to. Mark, thank you. I'm a subscriber. And uh, it's a feast, sometimes a little over my head, but <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And, uh, and this was a treat. Chaos and Grace, available everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mark Galley. And I'm going to close with a powerful proposition from your book. As we read the New Testament, we're reminded time and again that the gospel isn't about making life safe and orderly, but entails the risk of following Jesus. It's not about improving people but about killing them and creating them anew. It's not about helping people make space for spirituality in their busy lives, but about a God who would obliterate our private space and fill it with himself. Hmm. Is that what you're enjoying? If you know you're not and you've been challenged, I want to challenge you first to call our prayer lines and have someone agree with you about growing in new ways. Maybe surrendering to Jesus Christ and his plan for your life for the very first time. This could be a great chaotic day for you. Actually, the Prince of Peace initially, truly, brings such a peace to your heart. And maybe you need to taste that today. And um, mm, chaos and grace, I know you'll enjoy it. Discovering the liberating work of the Holy Spirit. Mark Galley, thank you again. Thank you for this opportunity. Keep on.